I thought I knew about human anger. I had seen them fight, seen the savage nature of how brutal they could be when enraged. I've seen some of them attack others for various reasons, attacking a friend, stealing from them. I've even seen insults result in hospitalization for the offending party. Many across the galaxy has learned to fear a short-tempered and aggressive human. That is why I was so fond of Jonathan. He had all the good traits of that enigmatic species, passion for projects and ideas, their compassion for those less fortunate than themselves, the lengths they would go to for those they had forged intense bonds of friendship and love with. I had never realized how terrifying that last part could be. After his family died in the bombardment, I expected the rage I had seen in so many humans, the guttural cry, the explosive violence I had seen towards those who had earned their ire. What I saw at first was not what I expected. There was no raging cry of grief, no lashing out. There was just an almost deathly calm. I later learned this was not unknown to humans. One of their sayings captures perfectly what I didn't realize at the time. The calm before the storm. The ship dropped soon after the bombardment. They hadn't sent a fleet, not even a battle group. The settlement wasn't deemed defended enough to warrant more than one. They simply destroyed the security installations, butchered the Collian troops who defended the colony, and swept in to take the resources not destroyed, intending on enslaving the remaining beings. I took Jonathan to my hidden shelter, thinking him a broken man, wanting to hide my friend and hoping the invaders wouldn't find us, so we could report what had happened to those who came to investigate once the pirates had left. I didn't know at the time that he wasn't broken, but rather burdened with a terrible purpose. While we were hiding, we heard of one of the invaders near our hiding place. I thought us doomed as Jonathan moved unprompted for the first time since his family died. Before I could stop him, he had left our darkened room. As I tried to stay silent, I heard a dull thud. Surely Jonathan being subdued and feared for my life as the door slowly opened. Only then did I realize what had happened to my gentle friend. An unconscious pirate was thrown on the floor, and Jonathan followed after him, still with the same blank look that had haunted him since that fateful strike. He took the pirate to the basement and gagged and tied him securely to the table in that room. What happened next will haunt me for the rest of my life. He woke the pirate. I expected screams of rage, demands of the pirate asking why he had murdered his family. What I got was a calm, almost monotone voice. You will not leave this place whole, that much is certain. All you can control is how quick and painless this process will be. I am going to ask you questions. The longer you take to give me the information I need, the more painful and drawn out this will be. If you are lucky, I'll kill you once I'm done. He removed the gag to hear the invader's reply. He laughed in Jonathan's face and said, You think I'm scared of you, a nobody in a backwater colony that couldn't resist one ship? His laughter was cut short, and Jonathan grabbed once of his appendages and wrenched it till I heard the crunch of bones breaking, the laughs of the pirate replaced with pain. Still he was defiant. I serve the most ruthless pirate in this sector. You think broken bones will make me fear you more than him? Over the next twelve hours he learned that was only the beginning. I hadn't even noticed Jonathan put the small pan in the fire. I definitely never considered what he would do with it. First he scorched the skin of the pirate, calmly asking his questions. How many people were on the ship? How many were trained fighters? What weapons did they have? What sort of engine did they use? The pirate resisted for so long. I had never seen anyone take pain like that. I almost found a begrudging respect for that pirate's toughness. But everyone has their limit, and Jonathan found his. He wrapped a tourniquet around the pirate's limbs. I was confused for a second. The pirate's wounds were severe, but he was nowhere near at risk of bleeding out. After that, he gagged the pirate, not interested in what he had to say at that minute. I knew humans were strong, everyone did, but what I saw next almost made me cry out even though it happening to someone else. He put his foot on the invader's torso, grabbed his leg, and with scary force ripped the limb from the pirate's body, the screams heard even through his gag. You could hear the pirate trying to talk through the fabric stuffed in his mouth, finally broken seeing the blood loss even with the tourniquet. Jonathan ignored the noise and grabbed the burning pan and jammed it into the bleeding wound, cauterizing the wound and making the pirate's muffled screams even louder. Still, he didn't remove the gag, didn't ask any questions. He simply moved to next limb and repeated the process limb by limb 
until everyone was removed and sealed. Several times the pirate passed out. Each time Jonathan stopped, not resuming until he revived the pirate, not wanting him to escape one shred of pain. Finally, Jonathan spoke. Now you know what I meant when I said you would be lucky if I killed you. Next I'm going to take your eyes, then I'm going to ask my questions again. If I'm happy, I'll then take your life. If I'm not, I'll take your ears, then your tongue, and then I'll keep you hidden from any civilized mind, keep you alive, make sure you live a long life in your agonizing flesh prison. He followed through on his threat, burning the pirate's eyes until they were nothing more than charred pits. He removed the pirate's gag, and all the secrets poured from his mouth, answering every question he had been asked, volunteering any information he thought Jonathan would find useful, instantly answering any more questions asked. Once he was finished, he begged Jonathan to finish the job. Jonathan didn't keep his word. You showed no honor when you attacked without warning, murdered children. Why should I show you any? He burned the pirate's ears, took his knife and carved his tongue out. He kept watch over the pirate for the next hour, making sure he didn't choke on his own blood, making sure he didn't succumb to his wounds. Once it was obvious the pirate wouldn't die from his injuries, he turned to me. I know that must have been difficult for you to watch. I'm sorry for doing that to you. I'm leaving now. I will leave it up to you whether you leave him like this or put him out of misery. I'm leaving now. If all goes well when I come back, I'll knock four times slowly. If you hear any other knock, it isn't me. I croaked out the first words I had managed in hours. Jonathan, please don't leave him here like this with me. I can't bring myself to take a life, but I can't stay here with what's left of him. Please don't do this to me. Okay, friend, I shouldn't have done this to you. I'll take him with me. Sorry I have to leave, but remember, four knocks, or it isn't me. With that he slung the living meat that was once a feared pirate over his shoulder and left. Fourteen hours later, there were four slow knocks at the door. I removed the barricades, opened the door, and looked upon my friend. Every inch of him was covered in blood, breathing heavy, still that calm, monstrous look on his face. He saw the fear in my eyes, and finally he broke. He dropped to his knees and started sobbing, trying to speak, but I couldn't make out any words over his tears. I keeled next to him and held him in the closest fashion I could manage to a human hug, just holding my friend until there were no tears left. That was almost another four hours. Me and Jonathan left the colony a few months later, neither of us able to live in the shadows of the memories of that place. We went our separate ways at the next station, me to a more secure system, him to another colony he had family on. He told me he needed time to heal, and the colony he was moving to had a good psychiatrist who dealt with what the humans called PTSD. I met another human at my new home. He was friendly enough, more boisterous than Jonathan had been, but still full of those loving qualities I had admired in my friend. Once I knew him better, I spoke to him about what had happened. He seemed disturbed, but strangely seemed to understand what had happened. He explained that while aggressive members of their species would lash hour when threatened, use violence as a first solution, the gentle ones would avoid it until such point that the violence wasn't an expression of rage, but a tool used to ensure the targets of that rage would never be able to do in the future what they had done to others. It turns out they have a saying for that too. Demons run when a good man goes to war. 